Jordan. Good evening and welcome to Black Liberation, Seeking Freedom in 18th and 19th Century Newark. My name is Dale Colston and I'm Assistant Director for Special Collections here at the Newark Public Library. On behalf of our Board of Trustees President, Dr. Lauren Wells, and our Library Director, Christian Zabriskie, we thank you all for joining us here this evening. We are delighted to collaborate with the North History Society and NJPAC once again. We appreciate our partnership and hope that we've been a good neighbor. I would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muncie Lenape First Nations on which we are learning, laboring, and organizing today. We also recognize the devastation and the continued legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, which contributed to present day systemic racism and oppression. Our space here at the library, the James Brown African American Room, was named in honor of the late James Library Brown, a librarian, poet, activist, and influencer who was instrumental in making sure that the library seek and maintain books and resources and present programs examining and celebrating the African-American experience. Mr. Brown was especially committed to urging Newark youth to pursue education and to understand the importance of the library in their academic growth. We are excited to welcome two friends of ours this evening, Dr. James Amimisor, research specialist at the New Jersey Historical Society and Noelle Lorraine Williams, director of the African-American History Program at the New Jersey Historical Commission. We are grateful for your continued research and scholarship and you two are very much appreciated. Now, please join me in welcoming Assistant Vice President for Community Engagement at NJPAC, Aisha K. Marable. Good evening, everyone. I will not be before you too long. I just wanted to say thank you to Tim Chris and this partnership that we've had for a number of years with NJPAC. And it was his wise decision for us to move this program from NJPAC to the Newark Public Library. And here's our opportunity to partner with yet another amazing organization. And so we just appreciate you and all that you do and for the knowledge that this particular program brings. I would like to just take one moment to say on behalf of the Lenape, we start every season with this um, acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement, and then you won't hear it again. But we honor the land that we're on. And on behalf of our CEO, John Schreiber, we want to just uh, recognize that we know exactly where we are and the good work that we're doing. And thank goodness for Tim Chris and his good work, we understand the assignment. It is for us to appreciate our history to know from whence we've come so we can continue to share even with our youngins. Even if they're not in the room, we know that we have a host of people online that are learning with us. So we thank you if you're hearing this, if you can see us, we just appreciate you uh, joining us from afar. I will be reading uh, the land acknowledgement that was prepared for us by Chief Dwayne Perry. NJ Pack, Newark History Society and Newark Public Library, we, the three of us acknowledge that we are situated on land once inhabited by ancestors of the Ramapo and the Natico Lenap Lenny Lenape. We honor them and the generations of souls who have inhabited this land before us. And we are grateful to the Chief Perry of the Ramapo Lenape Muncie tribe and the Ole Oleana Whispering Eastern Salagi Algalquin descendant for their generosity, their wisdom, and labor to craft the following words. We were put upon this turtle island not to seek dominion, but as caretakers, and we gather here in a good way to be with the earth's children and all of their forms, those of the land, the water, and the air. We, the Lenape, the original benefactors of the land, once ripened and cultivated with attentiveness to the creator and her ascendancy, express everlasting gratitude to our creator for the traditional ancestral jurisdictions of the Muncie, Asopus, 
Canarsie, Capsi, Warpos, Suwano, Weekwakesi, jointly known together as the Ramapo and the Natakope, Lenny Lenape. We are the Lenape hoking today, and we will be for the remaining days of tomorrow, keepers of the past. Thank you. Well, my two predecessors have about thanked everyone that I was going to thank. So, uh, but but they left out two people. I'll, I'll give a shout out to John Cotton Dana and who left us the wonderful legacy of this library and of the museum next door. But I also want to thank those radicals of the 1960s and 70s who marched and sat in, sometimes tore up buildings in search of expanding and enriching the curriculum. And it was because of the their orchestration of American studies programs and African American studies programs and Hispanic studies programs that we have, uh, we are the recipients of the scholarship, the learning, um, the toil that students went through to find out, to, to provide us with a more inclusive past. And I'm very grateful to them and do not want to forget them um, as we hear two of the best and among the brightest people that I've ever met, Noel and James. So thank you to those students and faculty. And I know some of them are in this room right now. I thank you. I also want to give a shout out to James Brown, who during my first semester of graduate school um, had me here almost every day. I don't know how many hours a day I'd say I'm looking for this book, and he'd come out with 20 um, that I was to read. So many thanks to, to James Brown for the James Brown Room and for his tireless work for many, many years at this library. I worked with both James and Noel at the New Jersey Historical Society some 10, 15 years ago now. Um, I look the same, they look much older. Um, and I didn't know either one of them before we were thrown together in that venue, but what a wonderful time it was for the three of us to find two other kindred spirits who were concerned about the history of Newark, that untold history of Newark in many cases, just, just as much as I was. Um, they were both students at the time, um, but they also both were much wiser than their years. Um, their dedication to their scholarship to me for people that young was just uh, something that I, I wasn't as serious a student as they were. They were, they were just wonderful. So it does not surprise me at all that they are in the positions that they are in today. James, I think, goes first. So I'll, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about him. Um, so he, some of you who patronize the New Jersey Historical Society have probably seen him there in the reading. He's the archivist there and a wonderful archivist he is. Um, but he also teaches at Rutgers and at Seton Hall. So some of you who are students might have seen him there. I've never heard anyone um, criticize James in any way, except for Noel one time when she said, <laughs> and she, she said to me, James is a little shy and a little awkward and he wants to talk to you, but he's afraid of you. And she said, I keep telling him that he should just, you know, come to you and say what's on his mind, but he won't do it. So go to him, which is what I did. Um, but other than that, I've never heard a, a negative word uh, about him. And I think he's glad that I came to him at this point. Um, a, a scholar, a pa passionate about history. Uh, he has a, a long, um, career of, of teaching. He was head of the education department at Cape Coast Castle uh, in Ghana. 
And he came to the United States to receive his PhD, which I can't remember what it's in, James, but it's a long name, but, but he did. And even though um, we are in professions that don't pay well, uh, and I'm putting myself in there too, um, we enjoy our work and we enjoy sharing our work with, with other people. And there's no better feeling than knowing that you've turned a light bulb on in, in a mind, a light bulb that, that probably had never been on before. And I've seen James and Noel both work that kind of magic. And I'm very, uh, very, very honored and proud to be their friend. Uh, Noel's got this big shot job with this long title at the state. Um, <laughs> but she, <laughs> she still graces our, our, our presence. And uh, is oh, it reminds me that even though as much as she knows, she's always still learning and even turns a light bulb on in my mind every once in a while, which is a good thing. Uh, they both worked on the Harriet Tubman installation that's outside in Lincoln Park. So if you've seen that, you've already the beneficiary of their work. Um, James has done an enormous job uh, doing uh, research on slave ads, fugitive slave ads, that if you ever have an opportunity to look at his files at the New Jersey Historical Society, I suggest you do so. So I'm rambling and I'm gonna stop. I just, I was given uh, a, a charge to tell you, those of you who are virtual, that to put your questions in the chat. I got that right? Okay. Is anyone, I guess they're virtual somewhere, I just can't see them, but hello out there and put your questions in the chat, okay? So I'm going to bring you uh, James first, a memazor, right? Good. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Um, I remember very well when we were first hired. Uh, that was a long time ago. And uh, as you said, we've been working on community projects uh, ever since um, you left the society. And Noel and I work under you, so we're grateful for the opportunity and the friendship. And then uh, thanks also for your leadership in the history community broadly. Um, and uh, thank you. And thanks to Tim and the Newark History Society for putting this program together. Um, first, we had a conversation and it became a reality. I thought it was a very long time but it's just here with us. So we're happy for what you do for Newark broadly, uh, the History Society and team in particular, and everybody else who is associated with the Newark History Society. Um, and of course, uh, we are here to talk about Black liberation, um, seeking freedom in 18th century, 18th and 19th century Newark. Uh, and for the details of my invitation, I'm going to focus on the individuals, enslaved individuals, and their attempts to liberate themselves and their family members from slavery here in Newark. And I would do so by focusing on the 18th century, touching a little bit on the beginning of the 19th century, and then uh, Noel will take it from there, focusing on uh, the 19th century abolitionist movement and doing so from an uh, institutional perspective. So I just want to put that aside. And let me also say that uh, my talk is derived um, largely from an ongoing research project that uh, Linda already talked about, which is finding and documenting runaway slave advertisements, what we usually call runaway slave advertisements published in New Jersey's own newspapers from 1777 through 1808. 1777 because New Jersey did not have its own continuously published newspaper until 1777 during the Revolutionary War. Uh, before then, New Jersey relied on Philadelphia and New York City as far as news was concerned. And so most of these things are found in non- New Jersey newspapers until the beginning or the end of 1777. And 1808, because that was when the transatlantic slave trade was officially brought to an end in the United States. So my work focuses on this time period, 1777, 1808. 
and looking for runaway slave advertisement published in New Jersey's own newspapers. And I would like to use the opportunity to thank the New Jersey Historical Commission, the world, uh, for awarding me a research grant to pursue this particular interest. It's still ongoing. I have not finished it, but I'm going to get it done. Um, you can see the title of my talk uh, this evening uh, is running like a fugitive just to save the life I live. And then I, I should have put that in a quote because it is inspired by the lyrics and the performance of uh, the late Jamaican reggae superstar, Bob Marley. Um, for those of my friends who do not know as of now, I'm a lover of reggae music. <laughs> when I'm writing, uh, thinking very hard, there's always some reggae music in the background to motivate me. And, and the title of the song itself uh, is called Iron Lion Zion. Uh, Gail was talking about John, James Brown being a poet. Uh, of course, uh, these reggae superstars are poets in their own right. And I believe the song was dedicated to the group of freedom seekers that we often call runaway slaves. That is enslaved people who run away from their master's service. Um, I call them fugitive slave abolitionists uh, because running away from a master's service uh, was self-liberation from bondage self-liberation to so sort of runaway slave advert ads or fugitive slaves called them fugitive slave abolitionists. What they were doing constituted being just being abolitionists in their own right, even though they did that individually. So I had wanted to share the official animated video clip that illustrates Bob Marley's song, Lion, Iron, Lion, and Zion but I didn't know the platform was going to support that. So I put it aside. But if, if you are interested in looking at that, please do. The title again is Iron, Lion, and Zion. Um, so what I intend to do this evening is to share a few images of fugitive slave advertisements as evidence of uh, the existence and institution, the existence of the institution of slavery in Newark and the efforts that enslaved people made to free themselves and free their loved ones from the institution. Uh, and as I said earlier, running away from a slave master's service uh, is the most documented uh, self form of self-liberation from bondage. The practice began soon after the institution of slavery in the new world and was a very worrying trend in the province of New Jersey that laws were passed as early as 1694 during the proprietary period to regulate the practice. By, nine, by 1713, when New Jersey became a colony, uh, a new law required that any enslaved person found over five miles from the owner's home without a written pass or authority of the owner, that enslaved person should be whipped on the bare back and retained. And, and those from other provinces should be flogged and jailed. Rewards were specified for those who took them up. Next slide, please. So as you can see from my next slide, right, I can't see it from here, but I'll do my best. Um, Runaway slaves uh, advertisement appeared in Newark. The first one that I am aware of was published sometime in 1748, October 31st, 1748. That's the earliest that I have seen. And um, it was about an enslaved man called um, Charles. And the, the ad was published in the New York Gazette and of course, his age was 35 years. He was a black man, and he ran away from his enslaver called Emmanuel Coca, who was a vestry man and a petitioner for the Charter for Trinity Episcopal Church in Newark in 1746. Um, very often, when I'm looking at these ads, I pay more attention to the enslaved individuals and, of course, the owners who subscribe to the ads. 
and very often it's not easy to find information on either. The notice was reprinted six times, which was very indicative of the fact that the owner was determined to repossess Charles. We do not know what happened to Charles, whether he remained a free person or whether he was recaptured at some point. While we may never know that, we know for a fact, or we can imagine the feeling of terror and anxiety that might have clouded his life and thought as a fugitive running to preserve his unalienable rights endowed by his creator. So these are some of the details. And as you can see, I highlighted some of the things. You can see uh, some of the areas. New work appeared in that ad. And uh, the Negro man, Charles, you could see that he had only first name. There was no second name. So finding any information on such an individual is very hard. And he spoke broken English. He had on, when he ran away, quite a number of things, uh, including a red jacket. And as I said, uh, rewards were always available for anybody who was going to recapture these enslaved people and return them. Um, very important that we keep this in mind because the rewards also open windows for other people, slave hunters, to go out there and hunt anybody who was suspected to be an enslaved person because it was rewarding. It was just a business for a group of people, leading eventually, as we know, to the establishment of the police institution in the country. And so some of these things play out one way or the other. Now, my next slide, let me just talk about that briefly. Yeah, this is another slide. I believe this is the 1758 slide. And again, Newark appears in there. I think I'm probably going to use this for a second. Newark appears in there, but similar flight advertisement relating to Newark were published in newspapers in the 1750s and onward. And one such notice is the one that is on the screen. It was about a 26 year old male of African ancestry and was published on the 7th of December, 1758. Um, he was reported to speak good English and plays well on a violin. He had on when he went away, a jersey, a provincial coat, red jacket, and a white trouser. His enslaver was Benjamin Williams of Newark, and he offered 40 shillings in reward for his capture and return. Quite interesting. Next slide, please. The next slide is more of a text. And so we probably can look at some of the highlighted areas. But the slave owner, David Ogden of Newark, and this was dated 1773, May 11, 1773. And this early fugitive slave act of resistance against enslavement um, in Newark set a trend for how successive generations of enslaved people in the city, men and women, uh, struggle for freedom and liberty during the American Revolution itself. So as we can see, 1777, right here in Newark, while the revolution was cooking, uh, there were other people who were also running away for their uh, freedom. Next slide. I hope you can read some of the highlighted sections. It's, it's very hard to read all of them, so please bear with me. Uh, the next slide is one that was published on July 1st, 1776, and uh, very important, Jacob Wilkins ad, and it was about a black man, and pretty black, he was a guinea born and spoke bad English, and all the details, and the sort of things he carried with him. Um, but let's bear this in mind that 1776, July 1st, was a very important day. Because the following day, New Jersey declared itself a state. So New Jersey statehood came into existence uh, with the constitution that was adopted. And so putting this vis-a-vis, -vis, this particular vis-a-vis, -vis, the ideals of liberty in New Jersey is very important. But the details are out there that you can glance through. Uh, what I want to highlight is the contrast of dates. 
and very important. So this ads, 1770s and onwards, were very instrumental moving into the post-revolutionary war era. And in the post-revolutionary era, there is a particular ad that I would like to talk about, which is the fugitive slave abolitionism continued as a major issue for slaveholders and non-slaveholders after the Revolutionary War itself. Next slide, please. We know, for instance, that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, back a little bit. Thank you. This is a very important ad published in Newark's own newspaper. Newark had his own newspaper. First issue was, I think, on the 19th of May, May 1791, called Woods Newark Gazette and published right here in Newark. So that was the first time. And about a few months after the first issue, we saw this particular ad, which was subscribed by Jedea Green. And uh, it has a lot of details. Let me just grab this for a second, if I can do this. I don't know if you can see this clearly, but it was about a black woman by name Phyllis. Again, enslaved people were identified by their first names only. She was about 40 years of age. And then um, all the details about her and the things she carried with her. And then uh, it is supposed, very important, the section that says it is supposed um, she was led away by a free Negro or mulatto, fellow known in this town by the name of James Ockus. He's about five feet, six inches high, walks crooked, wears blue coat with red facings, and it goes on. Whoever will take up said wench and return her to the subscriber shall have the above reward of $15. Very important. What I want to highlight here is the individual efforts and the contribution that was coming from James Ockers. Uh, we know James Ockers was, as far as the ad was concerned, he was a free person living in Newark. And so based on his social standing, the material benefits that his stand, status gave him as a free person, he would not have even dared to help anybody. He would have been satisfied that he was a free person living in a society with slaves. And therefore there was no need for him to have anything to do with the institution of slavery. Yet he was supposed to have led a free black a person, a, a black, a, and a, and a slave woman out of town for a reason. So I want us to keep that in mind as we, it's okay, I'll do it from here. Um, give me a second. Now, very important that we keep that in mind because uh, we will get to know that uh, acts like this engineered or help new workers in particular, white new workers to find ways to control that. It was not deemed to be very important or very, it was very considered very dangerous for the society. Uh, and so let's bear that in mind. And also of course, ads like this also laid the foundation for the institutions that were created after the revolutionary war, including the constitution itself, um, article, for section two of the United States Constitution that scholars often refer to as the fugitive slave clause came as a result of some of these efforts that individuals were putting in place. And then of course, um, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which was called an act representing fugitive slaves from justice uh, and persons escaping from service of their owners passed by Congress was also in response to this. Very important. So in other, in other words, what we're saying is that while the American Revolution advanced the ideals of universal human equality, it left intact the economic and social underpinnings of slavery. Uh, those abolitionists and slave hunters, for instance, or the ideals nevertheless had some impact, impact on enslaved people, abolitionists and slaveholders. Um, and of course, hunters or slave hunters who all grapple with the promise and the reality of freedom in a post-revolutionary landscape. And a case in Newark in reference was what I had referred to here uh, about 
the enslaved person who was running away. Next slide, please. Now, these activities of James Ockles and Phyllis, for instance, and a lot of other people, as I said, motivated white new workers that something had to be done. And around 1801, there was a notice published in one of Newark's newspapers, Sentinel of Freedom, the second newspaper published in Newark, uh, asking for citizens to meet. And the subject to be discussed was concerning the Blacks or Black force, and the meeting was going to be in Stephen Halsey's long room. I'm not quite sure where that building was once, but this is the message. And what they wanted to do was what could be done about enslaved people and free Black people coming together. And something needed to be done about that, uh, to control that. So next slide, please. Now, that adjourned meeting was followed by actual meeting that was convened and somewhere January 20th, it was published. And as you can see, the annotation there says, an adjourned John Men meeting, citizens of Newark in the long room of Stephen Halsey, unanimously resolved that a committee of 15 be appointed who are required by lawful means in the power and first to prevent the unlawful residence in the town of Newark of such as falsely declared themselves to be free and Negro slaves. And second, to prevent Negro slaves from meeting together in an illegal manner. And third, to prevent their unlawful absence from their owners after 10 o'clock at night. And fourth, to prevent persons unlawfully dealing with or, or employing Negro slaves. And the committee members were 15, and uh, John N. Cannings, who was a, a general in the Revolutionary War, I believe, was a member of that, and quite a number of Newark, um, uh, you know, people of influence in Newark. And among them was also Asha Gifford, uh, whose house was a very important place. And I came across some ads that enslaved people who were advertised for sale and were not sold, anybody who wanted to buy them could go into to Asha Gifford's house. And of course, Benjamin Cole, some of us are aware about the Benjamin Cole family uh, as slaveholders. And then David D. Crane, who was also a member of the committee. David D. Crane was also a slaveholder. Not only that, he also served as uh, a justice of the peace of SS County at some point. And so in the Manumission records of SS County, we also noticed that he also emancipated some of his slaves. Very important to think about this act because largely enslaved people and free black people getting together to deal with issues that were of concern to them, particularly their freedom. Yes, please. Yes, very important, thank you. Um, by this time, the issue of uh, black people coming to New Jersey uh, was of concern. So the state actually passed quite a few laws, maybe one or two, to prevent black people coming from other states um, as free people to New Jersey. And so that was inspired by that. And secondly, this was the era where, or the period of the French, the Haitian Revolution, which was started in 1794, thereabout and ended around 1804. And then a Frenchman who was traveling across the United States reported uh, during his travel, he visited New York in around 1797 and noted that uh, quite a number of Haitians or people from Haiti came to Newark and they were employed in the shoe industry in the city. And so the revolutionary ideas coming out from Haiti I believe the individuals who came from Haiti were not black people, but the fact that they were revolutionary ideas, they were escaping from a place with revolutionary sentiments, that also alarmed, of course, Newark residents largely. And there was a need to prevent, right, unlawful residents in the town of free Negroes or free blacks who were coming here. 
So these are some of the reasons I believe uh, counted for this kind of meeting and the measures that were put in place to regulate black lives. Um, now, next slide, please. Now, very important, this is another ad that appeared in Newark newspaper. Um, and the date, you can see the bottom there, February 8, 1802, and it has in reference to Newark. Uh, this is a very good act, a very good ad, I should say. And it's about an enslaved person who ran away from his master. And he ran away July 26, 1779. And, um, and then the descriptions, he spoke low Dutch and good English, uh, not so very black as many of the African race. And, and of course, very important details out there that you can see. But more importantly, this enslaved person was reported to have been seen in province, Rhode Island and another time in Lyme, Connecticut. And then when attempts were made to arrest him, to capture him, he escaped and was supposed to be somewhere around the East Coast shore. Uh, very important, and the reason why I want to highlight this in greater detail is the time he escaped, which was 1799 July, and the time his owner, David Banks, advertised for his risk capture. Quite a number of days, almost 1,000 days apart. And not only that, he also indicated in the original ad, which appeared, this is not the original one, this is a, another one, that pub, newspaper publishers in Rhode Island and Vermont, she continued to publish this ad. And so they published it a number of times after the initial one, until sometime March, beginning of March, 1802, so quite about 960 days. What is of interest here is two things. The enslaved person will, of course, he had the willpower to escape, continue to run, continue to run as a fugitive, running to save the life that he was living. And not only that, but his, his enslaver, David Banks, was equally determined to get him Right. So regardless of the time span, he was determined because he considered him his property. And then the slave man also regarded himself that, look, probably it was better to be a free, hungry black man than being somebody's uh, enslaved property. So he was determined to run and continue to run. But what is very important about this ad is, as I said earlier, the anxiety and the terror that this individual could carry with him while he was trying to preserve himself, preserve the unalienable right that his, own, that his creator had endowed him. That level of terror, nobody knows what he went through. Whether he was ever captured or not, we just don't know. Uh, and we don't have any information, as far as I know, any information about him because, one, he went by only one name, Will, Possibly he changed that name at some point. We don't know what else is out there about him. So these are some of the ads that I would like to highlight. And of course, I'm happy to take questions, but before I do that, the next slide, let's look at the next slide briefly, which is about 1809. And it was published or subscribed by Benjamin Co. or Sayers Co. Very important, about a black man called Tom. Uh, he was 24 years old and he called himself sometimes James Roberts. And uh, he was seduced away by a stout black man named Sam Thomas, who calls himself free. So we can see the dynamics here. Uh, but more importantly, by Benjamin Cole, who was this individual, Sae? Those of us who are very familiar with Newark history, uh, we know that Springfield Avenue uh, was called Springfield Tenpike, Springfield and Newark Tenpike, which was constructed at the beginning of the 19th century. So we have records of Sayez Co um, having his enslaved people working to, build, to construct the Springfield Avenue uh, that we have today. And Tom was also one of the enslaved people that was purchased sometime at the beginning of May. So I'm not quite sure which of the Toms here, but this is something that can be looked into. Uh, my next slide, please. 
Now, what do we gain from all of this? What are some of the insights that we can gain from what I call fugitive abolitionism? As I said, they are fugitive abolitionists fighting for freedom in their own right. So first and foremost, we can see their names. Very often, a Negro man called Joe or a Negro woman called Phyllis. They never had first names. I will say uh, last names. But this is the only time that we read very often about enslaved people and having a name. Usually when you go through other accounting books, usually it's only Mr. Susan So's Negro without any name at all. Or all you see is the racial identifiers or what someone would call maybe racial profiling or no. You also see their place of abode, where they lived before, right? Whether they live with other people before, very often. And then the agenda always highlighted their age, height, physical descriptions, distinctive features of these individuals, the clothing they had carried with them. And one would wonder, why do they carry so many clothes with them when you are running away? Because as an enslaved person, that's all you had. That's the, all you had in this world. And so it, it meant a lot to them. And of course, we also see their occupation, what they were capable of doing, their former owners, the language skills that are highlighted, their personality. Uh, sometimes they even wrote their own uh, passes. Uh, we see this very in different places. And then the likely destination that they were heading to, and largely their personality traits and the motivation behind some of these. And of course, the goals and the dates and the number of weeks that sometimes these new papers should be published so that they can reclaim them. Like David Banks, he instructed newspaper publishers in Vermont and Rhode Island to continue to publish that. So these are some of the insights that we can gain from runaway slave advertisements or fugitive slave advertisements, uh, which gives us understanding of the culture of runaway slave uh, society the time period they were running away and what their motivations were, very important. My next slide, and that will be the last slide. Now, what are we doing here? Um, what is all this about? I would like to leave you with a quote from a French politician uh, who was elected in office, into office in 1848. His name, Pierre Joseph uh, Proudhon, if I see the name right. But he wrote in 1840, and he said, if, we were asked, if I were asked to answer the following question, what is slavery? And I should answer in one word, it is murder. My meaning will be understood at once. No extended argument will be required to show that the power to take from a man, his thought, his will, his personality, is the power of life and death. And that to enslave a man is to kill him. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. Wow, y'all had a long day, I guess. Me too. <laughs> a long day. So I want to first say thank you to everyone who's here today. Thank you to Linda for coming out and speaking um, and introducing um, us after um, the heartbreak that just occurred in her family. Thank you, Linda, for joining us. And um, thank you for representing for African-American history in New Jersey for such a long time. Um, thank you, James, for being a great colleague. And of course, the Newark History Society for supporting this scholarship. So I'm a little bit more informal than James, but it's OK. <laughs> um, first, let me please just um, Observe, observe just a couple of moments for the enslaved people throughout the world, but the enslaved people that literally lived on these streets.
as James was speaking, I was thinking of a nine-year-old girl who after um, her enslaver died in the Plume House, right by Broad Street Station, was sold by the bridge down the street. And it's interesting because on my way over here, I saw 10 and 11 year and 12 year old girls. And so as James was speaking, I thought of this nine year old girl standing by the bridge for sale, just a block and a half away. So the original title of this piece was going to be Who Gets to Be a Revolutionary? Because all of us don't get to be revolutionary. Some of us become rioters. Some of us are deemed as troublemakers. Some of us are insurgents, right? So only certain people generally are called revolutionary. And we know who those people generally are, right? But I decided to call it and not give it another title because I only have so much space and it's called falsely calls themselves free as you might recall from James's presentation illuminating national black freedom movements in Newark next so my project can you go back one slide oh okay I guess I have my pages messed up. So my project is called Black Power 19th Century, and it's a multimedia public humanities history and art project that I actually started in 2018. Um, one of the projects is right here in the hallway, so please stop by. It's a pop-up exhibition um, commissioned by the city of Newark. Um, thanks to the Mellon Foundation for providing funding to the city of Newark uh, for that exhibition to go with the Harriet Tubman Monument. Um, so this project of mine is an art-based project, but I utilize primary and secondary archival sources for all of the work that I do. Um, so even though it has a surrealistic element, it's all based in primary and secondary archival sources coming from archives across the country and sometimes internationally. I think someone's phone is ringing. <laughs> um, I have include my website and please join me on my Instagram page. Um, the next slide. Oh. You know what? There's a screen back there. This is so exciting. I know, I don't have to like move my papers around. So we can actually go to the next slide. So that's actually, before we go to the next slide, this is a picture of my website. So you know when you found it, you're in the right place. Okay, next slide, slide please. Oh, great. So why is a project like Black Power 19th Century needed? Um, as we continue to engage in conversations about public history and justice and what it looks like in our school streets and public monuments, and we work to observe the 250th commemoration of the United States Declaration of Independence, it is urgent to understand all of our histories, all of our cultures, and all of our conceptions of freedom. A national and international context helps us to understand the enduring legacy with a freedom and ideas around freedom with communities across the globe. Next slide. So I'm just sharing a couple of the projects that I've done since I started this project. Um, so the first one is his, um, being the historical advisor on the Harriet Tubman Monument. When you guys, if you haven't gone outside, there's actually history written inside, um, which I um, advised on with Linda and James. Um, the pop-up, which you should go to today or go to another day, bring your friends and your family. Um, the a billboard project over by Broad Street Station um, in a mural on Black women suffragists at Broad Street and Edison Street. And finally, the thing of which I'm the most proud of, which is getting the Underground Railroad site that no longer exists on the Frederick Douglass 
um, field recognized by the National Park Service as one of the North's um, only recognized Northeast Jersey sites. Thanks, that makes me feel better about these white hairs. Thank you. So the first thing that's important for all of you to understand today, and this is why framework is so important for me and I'm taking up 20 slides to talk about it, is that local history uh, told in public spaces is often treated as if it's separate from national and global history, it is not. There's always this conception that Newark is somehow a separate place than the rest of the United States. Somehow it kind of floats above the world <laughs> and it's not connected to any other immigration, black power, work and labor, industrial building, colonial period anywhere. Well, I'm here to tell you in case you don't know, that's not true. Uh, much of local history deals with the ownership of land, um, either through coercion and violence, and also finding cheap or free labor to profit from it. Um, whether we're looking at enslavement, indigenous lives, feminism, workers' rights, these are common elements. Uh, 19th century Black liberation and underground railroad work, oh, Look at me, I'm going ahead of my slides. Next slide, sir. <laughs> Keep on going. Wow, I was just running. <laughs> Actually, go back one slide. I went too far forward. Okay, 19th century Black liberation and underground railroad work questions the colonial settler and revolutionary public history narrative because it demands freedom in public space for all. So even with the issues that Black power, Black, black um, nationalist movements bring, right, including um, problematic ideas about womanhood, sometimes misogyny, they still question the colonial settler and revolutionary public history narrative. Uh, next slide. So here, I just wanted to share a map. It might not be too clear to you, but um, it's a new map of the English plantations in America. It was issued in 1675. One of the things when we think about plantations is that they're simply areas where you produce a crop that is used for subsistence. So originally Newark was labeled in one document as the Newark plantation. So um, the map situates both unceded land from indigenous communities within an English colonial settler context. So it's important for folks to leave today understanding New Jersey as a colonial settler space. Um, and if you need a deeper understanding of that, you could revisit Tim Chris's presentation a couple of months ago about indigenous life in Newark. What we now call New Jersey, including Newark, was founded as a colonial settlement. Um, next slide. Okay, next slide. So since I specialize in public history, public art, public conversations, um, a lot of my examples will revolve around things in the public. So even if we take a look, so one of the kind of core aspects of Newark history is Newark's founder, Robert Treat. So outside the library, we have a statue um, of an ambiguous Puritan, um, we, we'll call them Robert Treat, um, an ambiguous indigenous person. and. One of the things this monument represented is that the Native American indigenous person is supposed to be looking towards the mountains and the Puritan who we're gonna imagine as Robert Treat um, is looking towards industry. So looking towards the economy and the development in the downtown. This was originally, this monument was actually in the, used to be in the middle of the street 
So cars would be coming, um, what is this called, south, and they would also be going north, um, but now it's moved to the side of the park. Over here, we have another depiction of, and let's just pretend like this man is Robert Treat, right? So the, this is actually the portrayal of the Great Swamp Fight um, in South Kingston, Rhode Island, where Robert Treat, the same Robert Treat who's seen as a spiritual leader in Newark, was actually the military commander or one of the military commanders for what is perceived as one of the worst attacks on a Narragansett settlement where 300 to maybe 1,000 non-combatants were killed. So when we're talking about non-combatants, we're talking about women and children. Next slide. The reason why I brought this example up briefly is again to think about framework. So when we have these public monuments, we have these public sculptures, we have hotels, streets, books, named after people and they're represented as spiritual and visionary leaders. What I think it's also important to understand is their whole history. So I think we also need to include Robert Treat as a military leader um, and as someone who was a part of a major massacre. Um, when he died, not including the property he passed to his descendants in Newark, he actually owned more than 600 acres of formerly indigenous lands in various towns throughout Connecticut. And also at his death, one historian writes, among the items of his personal property, the inventory shows that he had two slaves, a prize at 85 pounds. Next slide. Like many of the founders during this period and those following, like George Washington, which is like my central character in the pop-up exhibition <laughs> that's over on the side, please visit it. Um, these founders were community and military leaders. They were investors engaged personally and economically invested in the individual and communal dispossession of indig indigenous and African people. So the crowd I'm speaking to now are the folks who say people enslaved and oppressed and pushed out people because it was a part of their culture. And what I'm introducing is that it's a part of their profit. These are investors, they're entrepreneurs, they're businessmen, and the laws that they create, some of which James touched upon earlier, and the things that they do are about enriching their lives and the people and their family. So these investments into land and property are what lead to the contemporary presence of Blacks most Northeastern and most Northeastern mid-Atlantic cities. So by the 18th and 19th centuries, African-Americans in Newark lived here for centuries and migrated from other states, islands, and countries. Uh, next slide. So um, over here, you'll see the map that's in the exhibition. One of the things that was important for in this exhibition in the hallway um, was to really to get audiences to think of the global reach of Newark's history. Um, so when you go to visit the map or if you visit it, you'll notice that there are also islands um, superimposed like Barbados, uh, Eustatius, um, and Haiti. Uh, James touched on Haiti and um, thoughts about Haiti here in Newark. Next slide. So from colonial settlers to investing in the seeds of industry. So I'm not, oh, you can't really see it so much, but a section of greater Newark is now is what was once called New Barbados. It was actually right on the other side of the Passaic. Um, enslavers from Barbados moved there. In Newark, the richest man in Newark had actually had a plantation in North Carolina and actually on another island. 
So when we think of Newark and the surrounding areas, we can also think of plantation owners coming from other places um, like Barbados, um, investing here um, and trying to make more money. Next slide. So falsely declare themselves to be free. The Underground Railroad, Newark, and America's longest civil rights movement. The, na uh, the National Park Service declared that because African Americans, and as James explained in his paper, were seeking freedom and helping each other find freedom from the time we got here, that if we look at it, if we have the long perspective of the Black liberation and Black freedom movement, it is the longest civil rights movement in the United States. This is from the National Park Service. And so this is one of the reasons why it's important to not only understand the Underground Railroad, but to contextualize it and put it on that level and on that table of what we think about revolutionary work, vision, ideals, and practice. Next slide. Hi. Hello. Hi, may I please? <laughs> Um, thank you. So the the fruit of all of this hard work of um, pushing indigenous people to the Orange Mountains, enslaving children and women, as you saw in James's presentation, you had 40 and 49 year olds running away with sometimes few prospects. Uh, Newark, New Jersey actually became a very important place, according to Angelina Grimke. Um, are, if some of you are familiar with the Grimkes, Angelina Grimke was a famous um, feminist, abolitionist, I should say women's rights abolitionist, um, and she actually lived in Belleville. So she wrote to a friend of hers in Philadelphia about this place called Newark. <laughs> Newark, New Jersey is a very important place. Its Southern interest is powerful. Shoes and carriages made here are bartered for the gold of the South, which is gotten by the unrequited toil of the slave. So what I need for you all to imagine is a circle. So in this image I created, this is a black woman picking cotton in the South. And the cotton that she's picking in the South is getting processed in the North. Right? So let's think of a circle of production, a circle of investment, and then we can understand a circle of fugitive slave laws, right? We can understand the circle of how African Americans were barred from going certain places, they were restricted, allowed, stolen, and kidnapped, all in the support of economic. So it wasn't just about disliking someone. Next slide. Thank you. So these are the first two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 14 mayors of Newark. So all of the ones in green are all ones that had some connection and profit to enslavement. All the ones that are in pink are ones that were, let me make sure I'm getting this right. James asked me about it a couple of times. The American Colonization Society, which was a part of the movement to send free blacks to Africa. The ones with these beautiful pink banners were a part of this 1839 meeting that took place right near Military Park, um, where business leaders and political leaders in Newark came together and declared their alliance to the South and the right to enslave people and decided that they would not interfere and that as common white people, it was not up to them 
to break the bond over something like slavery. So the men with the banners, they were leaders at the 1839 meeting. So this should give you a sense of how many of Newark's earliest mayors were connected to enslavement and connected to colonization. Next slide. So the public memorializing of colonial settler revolutionary era and pre-industrial leadership is in direct conflict with both black enslaved and free freedom and freedom on this land. That is what makes black liberation work in Newark revolutionary. Um, and as James shared this um, ad already, um, one of the things I wanna just highlight again is it's supposed that they were seduced away by a stout black man named Sam Thomas who calls himself free. And this is coming from Benjamin Coe, a noted Revolutionary War um, supporter. He actually sent his enslaved person to fight on his behalf. And when he came back alive, he gave him a house um, Benjamin Coe also enslaved um, dozens of people here in downtown Newark. But to imagine someone fighting for freedom, saying that African Americans may have um, calling, called themselves free is something to consider. Next slide. So James already went over this slide, which is great. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight on this is, again, um, to prevent the unlawful residents in this town of free Negroes or such that falsely declare themselves to be free. So what we see is the process of uh, deconstructing and hindering Black community making, Black freedom making. So preventing enslaved people from meeting at night that's preventing black community making, to prevent people from talking with free or enslaved people, that's going against black community making. Next slide. And so over here, we have one of the earliest examples of what would be the foundation of the Underground Railroad and Black Freedom Movement. And that's African-Americans congregating. They actually asked Benjamin Coe to entertain a pastor, if they could have a room at the house um, to entertain a pastor. And this is one of the very intelligent ways in which African-Americans utilize churches as community um, uplift areas and as places to train and also accept um, freedom seekers. So we used to call them runaways and now we also call them freedom seekers. Next slide. So over here is a symbol I developed in 2019. Um, it's kind of vague here, we'll see it on another slide where I have the three churches that were all near um, the Frederick Douglass field. So what I need you to imagine today, um, if you haven't imagined it yet, is that black churches are underground railroad tools. So there's another scholar who actually believes that if you trace certain AME Zion churches and overlay them with underground railroad paths, that they will closely parallel one another. Often we think of white saviors as being the leaders of the black underground or the underground railroad movement. And today I need for you to consider that, um, of African Americans and church leaders as the vanguard. So um, the churches were also used as meeting spaces, fundraising, and political organizing. Next slide, please. So in 1841, someone wrote in the Colored America, what is Little Newark doing? She is generally first in this matter with such men as Cornish, Morrell, and Fields, each a host great things are expected of Newark. This was with regard to um, a holiday it's called the 1st of August, where uh, Black abolitionists here in the United States and anti-slavery folks uh, would acknowledge the emancipation of enslaved in the West Indies. 
they would get together in groves. One of the globe, groves that they got together was actually here in Newark, was actually in the Ironbound. Um, they would sing, they would dance. Um, it was also near the train station stop. So people could come from Manhattan and other places. And this is a way with, to kind of have other people in the community say, wow, we still have enslaved people here in the United States. So here we can also see kind of a global perspective that African-American freedom leaders had. Next slide. Even though much of early Newark's black liberation or revolutionary history has been destroyed or erased, some powerful examples remain. So we have Newark's oldest black church. I see Liz Del Tufo back there. <laughs> uh, so we have um, on Broadway. Um, now this wasn't where the original black church was. The church was actually over here by Raymond Boulevard on Academy Street. But when they moved, they moved to this church. So if you actually go and look at this church, it actually has the date of the original church on Academy Street. Next slide. This church is actually, once again, um, the church. So when folks move from the Frederick Douglass Field, Plain Street Church, which um, got the National Park Service Award, they went to 13th Avenue Church. So when they were building Society Hill, I guess folks like Sharp James, I'm sure it was a black woman who had Sharp James do this, <laughs> um, said, we have to mark this place. So we can't totally destroy it. Um, and so they kept one section of the church. Next slide. So you can't see this, so I'm actually going to read it for you. Um, on this sacred ground, the congregation of the 13th Avenue Presbyterian Church worshiped from 1883 to 1967. And then the most important part is 13th Avenue was established by 37 freed slaves who in 1835 left the old Presbyterian Church, which is still on Broad Street, to organize themselves as the first colored Presbyterian Church of Newark. The church was then placed under the care of Reverend John Hunt. That's wrong, it's actually Thomas Hunt. But this is one of the plaques and you know, as historians, one of the things um, we know and we see is that we have these waves of reclamation, waves of people reclaiming community. So this plaque acknowledging the history of the 35 people who had to leave Old First due to segregation um, is a significant one, but not that many people know about it. Next slide. So Old First, which is still situated at Broad Street, was the site of one of the most visible black revolutions in Newark due to the racism there. So like many churches in the region throughout the country in the early 19th century, they segregated blacks. Though it's not clear where blacks may have sat, um, the Presbyterian church in Orange made blacks sit under the steps. Um, there's an article about one in Boston. People actually sat in the balcony behind a wall with a slit in it. These places were called the African pew or the nigger corner. Um, and this is where blacks were segregated in church, churches. One Newark historian claims that blacks were forced to stand by the windows in First Presbyterian Church so they couldn't sit down. This is one of the reasons why they left, because they were giving money as members at Old First, but they were forced to stand and they had no voting privileges, and which sounds very familiar. Either way, Old First became a symbol of oppression. Later, it would be a fundraising site to send Blacks to Africa and of the colonization movement. Later on, Old First would change its face in the late 60s and the late 70s. And this um, idea or myth of Harriet Tubman visiting First Church would emerge, but that hasn't been substantiated. And the actual information about Old First um, is that it was a site of racism, though they did change their face in the 60s and 70s in the 80s. Again, what we're seeing is the history making pro process 
of all the communities in Newark and throughout the country. Next slide. The church that they would establish in the 1830s, the Blacks, would be Newark's second Black church. It was alternately named First African Presbyterian and other names. Later, it changed to Plain Street Colored Church. Many Blacks shifted from using the term African to colored due to the colonization movement. So if some of y'all are wondering why are a lot of churches called African in the beginning of the 1800s and then colored later on, is because people like Freelandheisen and Joseph Halsey, all of these folks were saying, well, if you guys are African, you need to go back to Africa. So then that's when Blacks start using the word colored. So, and this becomes Plain Street Colored Church, thanks to Samuel Cornish. Next slide. So this is something, this is a model I did early in this project. So in the same way as so-called European revolutionaries, African-American history in Newark uses the same tactics as stakes um, for rebellion. Rebellion is constituted through forming alliances, building of institutions, and acquiring the former land of indigenous people. So this should kind of give you an understanding of the proximity of the churches. For those of you from Newark, ooh, I have to wrap up. So for those of you from Newark, the church at the top of the hill, um, that was St. Philip's Church. So that those were the African-Americans that left Trinity Church. Um, the building at the bottom, that's Plain Street Color Church. Those are the Blacks who left First Presbyterian Church. And this church on Academy Street, which is also another uh, parking lot, is Newark's first African-American church. The two kind of stilt buildings, which are supposed to be brownstones, are Christopher Rush's house. He's an African-American bishop of the AME Zion Church. He bought a church. He bought a house there. And the one across from that is the Jacob King house, which you'll see. Um, I had to make this model. And once I did, the community made more sense as an underground railroad site. Next slide. So... Through the work, um, it was even noted in the Pennsylvania Enquirer that a part of buying the land for freedom was so that folks could actually vote. So petitions had begun to appear in some numbers for an extension of the right to suffrage to colored citizens owning freehold to the amount of 250. So this is a movement that African-Americans in New Jersey launched. Um, it's said that there are some 20,000 freeholders in the state and in the city of Newark alone, according to the assessment of 1842, their property was valued at 33,000. And they have likewise three churches, one public and two private schools. 1843. Next slide. So at Plain Street Colored Church, we have someone who's well known in Brooklyn. Um, how many of you have been to Weeksville? Okay, Weeksville is a great site. You should go to their preserved houses from African American activists and just regular people um, there. You can visit the houses and see how folks live. Junius Morrell was an activist here and actually took a quote from their site. What most people don't know is Junius Morrell taught at Plain Street Color Church too. And um, when I found one of the first direct um, articles connecting Newark to the Underground Railroad, because um, the first one was found by Teresa Vega, um, but so this is the second one. And so we have over here a quote and it says, there was one, meaning a freedom seeker, sent to our office by Mr. Morrell of Newark. So we put him on board of a canal boat, paid his passage to Oswego, and furnished him with money to go into Canada without calling on the vigilance committee for one cent. We assisted two slaves that were sent to our office by William Garner of Elizabethtown. Um, there was actually a William Garner downtown Newark as well, um, who was a white man who was friends with the African-American community. Next slide. So we don't have any images of Junius Morrell. His wife was an Underground Railroad conductor in 
Philadelphia. She died uh, when he moved to here and to Brooklyn. Um, we have this one article. And the only reason why we have this article is because Stephen Myers was speaking back to people who thought that he was stealing the money. They would sometimes give um, runaways or freedom seekers $5 um, so that they could make their way because often people didn't have clothes and things when they left. So these underground railroad conductors had to be accountable to folks. Um, so that's the only reason why we have this note that Mr. Morell actually sent someone from Newark and that someone else was sent from Elizabeth. Though so I think that was Newark too. So over here we have Thomas Hunt. Thomas Hunt was actually the secretary of what one black newspaper called the Underground Railroad Society here in Newark, which was between Plain Street Color Church and the AME Zion Church. So this Underground Railroad Relief Society raised money for African Americans who were on the Underground Railroad. So what's important for you to understand with this is that there are multifaceted ways in which African Americans, whites, and other people of color are assisting um, freedom seekers. So they're helping them to go from places like Newark to upstate. They're raising money for people. Women are sewing clothes for them. They're providing food. Um, over here, Wilbur Strong, um, he went on to continue to be an activist. And one of the things I love over here is that he said um, to an audience in Poughkeepsie, New York about the Declaration of Independence, he says, we must always stand upon the side of truth until slavery was abolished. Uh, next slide. So these are the superstars of Newark and the superstars of New York superstars of Jamaica, superstars of the country. We have Samuel Cornish and Samuel Ringgold Ward. Again, people rarely talk about Samuel Cornish, co-founder of the first African-American newspaper in the United States. Lived in Belleville, lived in Newark, owned several houses, downtown Newark, also owned property in Belleville. These are different things that people don't think about when they think about black citizenship in the North now, you know, even if we overlooked 200 years ago, right? Um, over here, we have Samuel Cornish. This is this book on the right side called The Colonizations, Colonization Scheme Considered. He published a, a pamphlet with his partner that was actually directed, you'll see on the cover, to Theodore Frelinghuysen, the statesman, and um, to Benjamin Butler, the president of the American Colonization Society, denouncing their work. It's a 35 page pamphlet. You can find it online, an amazing piece of writing. I'll be examining it for Rutgers next year, um, but it's just an amazing, powerful piece. And you'll see it's published here on Market Street in Newark. Samuel Ringgold Ward was someone that um, was much admired by Frederick Douglass. His mother and father, who were both freedom seekers, lived near, I guess, what is that? The FBI building near the Passaic River for years. Um, when her husband died, she moved to New York because uh, Newark was still an unsafe place for her to stay by herself. Um, next slide. Um, because of time, I won't read the whole thing. But one of the things I just want to call you to attend, call your attention to for this is how in the pamphlet um, we have Cornish in the 1830s already. They're making connections between what has happened to indigenous folks, what's happening with blacks in Africa during this period. So often right wing folks will often or conservative folks will say these are new ideas, right? They're not new ideas, they're published on paper. And 
here Cornish is quoted, in 1492, when Hispaniola was discovered, it contained a million of people, described by Columbus as the most affectionate, tractable, and peaceable that he had ever seen. 16 years afterward, when the governor made an enumeration, there were but 14,000 left. They had been reduced to this remnant by severe labor, insufficient rest and food, and other hardships. So did the Indians in Pennsylvania disappear before the colonists of William Penn, Samuel Cornish, Plain Street Color Church, and Underground Railroad activists. Um, while we we have while we don't have documentation of people coming to Samuel Cornish's house, we do have documentation of him fundraising to get money to give Underground Railroad freedom seekers for the New York City Committee Vigilance, Vigilance Committee. Um, again, this is another um, thing that folks did, collaborating with folks in other states to raise money for freedom seekers. Uh, next slide, please. So in my research for Black power in 19th century, um, I think it's just important for folks to know that all of these people moved between Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Delaware, Manhattan, and Boston, as well as Massachusetts. So Cornish was in Philadelphia. He starts a Black church in Manhattan. He comes over to Belleville, he moves to Newark, he works on the church here, he goes to Brooklyn, and he works on the community there. Samuel Ward, he is in New York, he comes to Newark, he teaches, he starts the Colored Anti-Slavery Society, he moves back to upstate New York, he goes to Canada, he goes overseas, he goes to Jamaica. I'll be working on a project soon, just illustrating in the map um, these different movements. Um, next slide. So again, it's important to understand all of these national figures came to Plain Street Color Church, not only Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, um, and that it's hard to find the stories of the Black women. Um, next slide. So as I showed you all on the previous map, the King House was near the church. This is Ellen King. Thank you to Beth Zach Cohen for finding this amazing picture of Ellen King. Um, and Ellen King, she lived there in that house until she died. Um, and I love this quote that Alicia Weaver um, actually wrote about her where he came to the door and he says, on alighting and tapping lightly at the door, we were met by Miss Ellen King, the eldest daughter, who, by the way, was very warmly and cordially received. The old folks were out, but returned home in the evening and hailed me with welcome. Nearly 10 years had elapsed since we had seen each other before, which was on the occasion of my first visit here and also to the East at that time. Um, this is important for you to see the culture. So if you have a stranger visiting the house, African-American going to the King house, we can see how freedom seekers, free people um, use these sites to build community, but what that might have looked like. So say if you were a freedom seeker, you could walk to the house during the day. Um, if you go online, you can also see an image of the basement of the house, though I don't believe that they always slept in basements. Um, this was a three-story house. Jacob King built this. Um, he was formerly enslaved by Henry Beast, who was actually one of the richest men in Newark. Um, next slide. So just a quote, um, thanks to Beth for pull quoting this, uh, that I think is important when we think about the Revolutionary War era and what it means to be a citizen in the United States. And Ellen King says, the white folks in the day didn't even give any thought to educating us, although they didn't mind taxing us. Wow. What? <laughs> next slide. So over here, we have an article, New York Times, 1860. Still, African-Americans, it's believed that African-Americans spirited, uh, how old was he? 10-year-old boy from a hotel on Broad Street. Um, 
from a Southern traveler. They're wondering if they have any case for keeping him. They're thinking he might have been, he might have an uncle in Brooklyn, um, but they're sure that it was African Americans in New York. And this is as late as 1860. Once again, just another example um, on the right is a video still from a video I made of a poem by Reverend Payson, who was a reverend at Plain Street Colored Church that he wrote um, in 1850 for the Fugitive Slave Law. So people were using arts and culture then. We think of spoken word coming out of the Black Power Movement in the 1960s, but there were folks writing. This was a 15 minute poem that Reverend Payson used to perform along the Eastern seaboard, um, raising money um, to help freedom seekers. Finally, uh, next slide. So um, that was just like a brief talk of 45 minutes, um, just to kind of touch upon these themes and the framework that um, I've shared more um, in the exhibition. Um, please visit the website, Black Power 19th Century, if you want to learn more um, in Newark's Underground Railroad. Um, so you can sit there in your home or on your phone and read more about the things I've shared with you. So today I didn't discuss that many women with the exception of Ellen King, um, but this fall I'm working on an installation. It's gonna be opening up in late November. It's called Stay the Black Women of 19th Century Newark. So I hope you can come out. Um, this is the O'Fake family and the Star Ledger. They were Newark's richest black family um, and they're one of the three women I will be profiling at the Ballantine House. So we welcome you there in late November. Uh, next slide. So I would like to close with a quote from the Color Anti-Slavery Society of Newark. Um, we are determined to use all godly, holy, and lawful means to undo our heavy burden and to break every yoke that the oppressed may go free. The Colored Anti-Slavery Society of Newark, 1834. Thank you. in uh, through the Q&A, um, I reckon it is 7.30, but perhaps you can take a couple questions. No, I just want to thank both of you. Yeah. yeah, we do have food back there. Need anything else? <laughs> Got James. Thank you both for your research and your scholarship. You are opening up so much for us. Um, are there questions here in the audience? Hi. Um, Very good. I loved it. Thank you both. Um, I have a question for James. And I'm sorry, I didn't know you get your name. Oh. Young lady. Oh, Noel Lorraine. Noel. Williams. Yeah, I have a question for you. So, James, um, in your um, presentation, there was a meeting at the, um, the Halsey meeting. And second um, point at that meeting was a uh, meeting of the illegal was, so what was not, what was considered illegal meeting? Because they couldn't meet illegally. So what, what did they consider illegal or legal? I mean. Right, <laughs> thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I think I was mentioning that by 1790s thereabout, I'm not quite sure what they did, but New Jersey passed a law uh, to that effect. And the idea was, as I think as far back as 1786, New Jersey passed a law to end the transatlantic slave trade, bringing Africans directly into New Jersey. And so this was part of the trend that by 1794, the state of New Jersey passed a law about people who were coming to the state on their own, um, who were people of African descent, 
as free people, that was not something that was considered tolerable. You could only come in when you had a master, right? In other words, the idea of what a, a scholar once called slaves without masters, right? And free people who were neither citizens nor fellow countrymen and women, uh, but they were also part of society was an issue going back to the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, and that was the beginning of the Af Amer African Colonization Society or what is called the American Colonization Society to make sure free black people who were on their own without masters were not tolerated because they constituted some sort of revolutionary you know, ideas and that sent bad message to people who were enslaved. So the formation of the American Colonization Society itself was to get rid of all free black people gradually over a period of time. The condition was that once you were free, you have to go to Liberia. And so anybody who was coming here around that time was considered really illegal. And I just think it's important to note that that states were routinely changing their laws to fit the needs of the businessmen and investors of the various states, while also sometimes trying to kind of accommodate claims for freedom as well. James is much better at this than I am, but you could see like 10, 15, 20 years, different laws will change. Um, depending on how people are petitioning for the legislation and what the things are changing. So even with the African corner and the Negro pew, like 30 years earlier, that didn't really exist in churches. But then as there were more African-Americans in churches and, you know, African-Americans um, of wealth and demanding their rights, um, then that's what you see, more segregation, more apartheid. Um, we're gonna try to alternate between in, uh, here and Zoom. Oh. You're getting lots of compliments long line. Uh, quickly, how long is the pop-up up, the pop-up exhibit? So, um, yes, to March. Thank you very much to the Newark Public Library for extending our stay here. So, uh, Bill May <laughs> has a question. Is there a connection between the Plain Street Presbyterian Church and the 13th Avenue Presbyterian Church? Yes, so basically what happened with the Plain Street Colored Church is that it started to, after 75 years, it needed lots of repairs, right? Um, and the Presbytery was like, well, we don't have money to fix the church, so we all have to demolish it, and you guys have to move out. And there are actually newspaper articles, I I've never really shared those, of the congregants at Plain Street Colored Church refusing to move out. They didn't want to move because they felt that that was a historic church. Um, you know, this was a church of rebellion, the Underground Railroad took place there. They didn't want to move. And so they moved to the 13th Avenue um, church. So that was the, the first of um, two churches they would move to. And then later on, they would move to Clinton Avenue. And that would be the last iteration of Plain Street Color Church. Oh, so uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, is there a rough idea of around the time of the revolution and then about 1840s, what are we talking about in terms of numbers of both free, free blacks and enslaved blacks during both those periods? Yes. Um, yes, I don't remember the actual figures, but quite a number of people um, were in New Jersey who were free. Um, you know, the, Gradual Emancipation Act was passed in 1804, which made it possible that uh, people who were born after the 1st of July, 1804, were to become citizens. I mean, were to become free. Let me just correct myself. But anybody who was born before the 1st of July, no, the 4th of July, I should say, 1804, will remain a slave. And New Jersey's position, of course, New Jersey is also a southern state and a northern state at the same time, um, because it's very long, stretches all the way beyond Baltimore, the southern tip of New Jersey, 
is even beyond the level of Baltimore. And so a lot of black folks were coming from the South, you know, as part of the Underground Railroad movement. So there were quite a number of people in New Jersey between this time. Actually, I have the figures, but I just don't remember the exact number of people within this time. But New Jersey had quite a number of free black people around this time. That is why, for instance, the formation of the American Colonization Society was led by a New Jerseyan, um, Dr. Uh, Finley, who was born in Princeton and was a, a Presbyterian minister at Baskin Ridge. And others got together and thought the only solution to the Negro problem, which means free black people here in their numbers, was to take them back to Africa and Liberia. So New Jersey was very instrumental in that process. By the way, towards the mid 19th century, um, by then, um, Justice of the, of the Supreme Court, Bradley, Philip Joseph P. Bradley, made it very clear the reason why he thought the only way slavery could end was to pursue or have more people to be members of the, uh, the American Colonization Society. That's the only way slavery could end in the United States. So New Jersey people were behind some of these movements because quite a number of African people were in the states who were free. And of course, Bradley was one of the Supreme Court justices yeah, from Newark. Court justice. yeah. um, and we know by 1830s, there are about 800 um, free, free Black people and about, I think it's about 15 or 13 enslaved Black people by um, the 1830s. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, you were talking about the freedom seekers. I like that term instead of fugitives. They were pouring into Southern New Jersey. So as they were moving around New Jersey, I didn't hear you talk much or even at all about, some people talk about um, uh, uh, safe houses and secret routes on your way to freedom. What evidence is there that there was very much of that going so, on? Okay, so one of the houses that I, I don't know if you saw the slide, um, it was a house with Ellen King on that. Ellen King, she was a part of the King family. That was what people like to call a safe house. Yeah, so I'm sorry if I was going too quickly. So that's um, the King family um, was is believed to have um, been an underground railroad station at that house. So one of the ways we've corroborated that is that Jacob King was also the treasurer of the Underground Railroad Relief Society. And we know um, and I discussed it a little bit, Junius Morrell, who was a teacher at Plain Street Colored Church, he also forwarded um, freedom seekers to uh, upstate New York. So the way you should think of um, the map I showed you with the three churches, so, so those regularly had underground railroad leaders leading them. So Samuel Cornish, he did fundraising for the Underground Railroad. Junius Morrell had been an Underground Railroad leader in Philly. And then we have the article saying that he sent someone from Newark. The Jacob King House, as Ellen King said, was an Underground Railroad house. We also know, according to the paper, that her father was the treasurer of the Underground Railroad Relief Society. So the thing that's powerful about this site was one of the reasons why the National Network for Freedom was excited about the application from Newark is because it's similar to the African Freedom Church in Boston. So you have three churches with underground railroad leaders. You have a what people like to call a station. I don't I, I apologize that I don't use um recognizably underground railroad language because I look at it as, as like black freedom um, activism. But Newark becomes a, a kind of amazing example, similar to Boston, of like a community of activists. Oh, 
Miriam. Thank you for your presentation. Uh -huh. Whatever happened, would you know, to the colored anti-slavery secret society? Did they survive to the Civil War? And was there ever an offshoot from them? Well, I'll let James speak to you with me because um, he keeps the records at the Historical Society. But it wasn't a secret society. Like there, there were, um, these were public societies. Noah, how long did it last before? I, I, I'm, I can't say definitively. I'm thinking six years, but James can answer the question. Uh, for having the confidence in me, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure how long it lasted. Um, but um, it was, I, as I was saying, the individual efforts, like James Ockold and uh, Sam Thomas, for instance, individuals like that could be regarded as abolitionists in their own right or the Underground Railroad conductors. And so the formation of the anti anti slavery society in Newark by Black people. The constitution was written within five or six days, and they were very militant. And so it was in existence probably by 1850, 59, thereabout, uh, until I think I would say that uh, slavery ended eventually in, in New Jersey. Uh, we're not quite sure when exactly the uh, anti slavery society uh, faded away, but I'm strongly of the view that until slavery ended on the 23rd of July. The so third of January, 1866, when New Jersey finally, finally, the governor, Marcus Ward, signed an amendment to New Jersey's constitution and abolished slavery forever in New Jersey. I strongly believe, but we can look into that and yeah. see. Thank you. Thank you for that question, because um, I always assumed it's five or six years. I think it's probably because I read that in the Black abolitionist papers. But I just want to say this was one of several groups. I didn't actually discuss it today, and James didn't discuss it. But there was the um, African Society that was established, what was that, 1818? here in Newark to raise money. Um, there was also one in New Brunswick. Basically, it was to raise money to develop Black young men as pastors. Um, so African Americans use this um, opportunity to raise money for Black men as pastors. And the white people supported it because they wanted those Black men to go to Africa to um, help with these communities and also um, convert Africans to Christianity. So it's interesting, and I don't ever get to discuss this much, the way that they're navigating existing systems. So you can't create like a community activist school in downtown Newark. So, but what can you create? You create a church. And there, they I didn't do this, I didn't discuss this. They had a school for young women, later for boys. They had folks like Garnett, who folks were like looking for, speaking there at the church. They were raising money, trying to bury people. These were multi-function centers. Maybe one more question. Um, oh, mine is quick. On your model, behind one of the buildings, looked like, the, was that the canal behind it? So, so, um, behind the church yeah um so behind the church over here in the forefront the big big church that's raymond boulevard and then so then that would have been the canal route yeah so behind the so behind right the behind that church was the canal um yes well later on yeah later on there was the canal because when was the when was the canal 1830 yeah, so yeah. the first church was created around 1826. So yeah, so that's Raymond Boulevard in the canal. And then um, on the field, those were the other buildings. And it's very interesting because the Christopher Rush house is totally uh, perpendicular to the Thompson house. Then the King house is next to that. So it's very interesting because they actually block each other's backyards. And then even though folks have said that Freelandhuisen um, donated the church, 
I haven't found or land for the church. I haven't found record of that, but it's, it's interesting. And I'll probably develop another model is how the backyards of the houses and the church are blocked um, by the buildings. And we recently did a scan of the field, but we weren't able to find anything because of so much construction on the field. Um, but they kept the African Americans who owned those houses owned them. They kept those houses up until the 1940s, I believe. And even in Christopher Rush as well, he was like, don't sell the house until, you know, you have to. So it was a very intentional community building um, that was going on there. Um, I hope you'll be willing to carry on the conversation with individuals after this. Um, but let's thank them again for a really splendid program. And we'll hope to see you again on November 16th for a program uh, about the Ironbound Community Corporation's environmental justice activism. You'll get news about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you.